thank you very much for being here. It's a very special night. It's our 2017 Lumiere Career Achievement Award, which is being given to Liz Garbus, which is really wonderful. And we have a whole... We have a wonderful uh, award presentation. I just want to take two, a minute to thank uh, our festival sponsors, Bridgehampton National Bank and Claudia Pilato, who has been with us from the beginning. Thank you, Claudia and Bridgehampton National Bank. <laughs> Brown Harris Stevens for our audience award. We do have balloted films, and there is a cash award for that, and the prestige of being the audience award. And uh, Douglas Elliman, for the first time this year, they are underwriting the Monday, the fifth day of the festival, free films all day for the community. So please come for that. I want to thank my board of directors, uh, Matt Hindra, Deborah Cooperstein, Jamie Coy Wallace, myself, <laughs> and the advisory board who are here tonight and are a wonderful, wonderful resource for us. We have our great meetings, great ideas, and they all make it possible. We work all year long on this festival, so that's why it's really seamless and wonderful. But I'd like to introduce uh, one of our board members, Susan Margolin, who is going to introduce Liz Garbus, tell you a little bit about her career. And um, the plan is that we'll have the Lumiere Award, and then you're going to see Shouting Fires, Shouting Fire, Stories from the Edge. A lot of people haven't seen it, so you're in store for a wonderful film, and Martin Garbus, First, First Amendment attorney, is here, so he's going to be doing a Q&A with Liz and Susan after the film, so please stay. So with that, I give you Susan Marglin. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, I just have to take a moment and just like, we have to have a round of applause for Jackie. I mean, just have to. She is unbelievable what she's been able to accomplish over the past 10 years. So um, it's, been, it's been such a treat to work with you. So um, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna read a couple of notes because um, Liz has an incredible, incredible um, list of accomplishments. So I'm, I'm not going to read them all, I promise, but really we need to cover some ground here. So, um, so Liz is one of the most lauded and prolific documentary filmmakers of our times. She's a two-time Oscar nominee, two-time Emmy Award winner, a Grammy nominee, a Peabody winner, and a DGA-nominated director. Yeah, really. <laughs> I've had the pleasure of knowing her for many years. Our paths crossed first when I distributed her groundbreaking Academy Award nominated film, The Farm, Angola, USA, which is an in-depth look at death row prison inmates through my company, Docurama Films. I had the good fortune to work with Liz on several other works directed by and produced by her over the years. In total, Liz has directed 27 films and produced 37. Liz first became interested in filmmaking while still in high school. She brought a, vi she brought a video camera to school on her last day as of senior year and made her first short film. She says that that experience sparked her to the nonfiction form and what a spark that was. Liz studied history and semiotics at my alma mater, Brown University. Fascinated by social politics, she considered a career in academia. But that spark ignited. After a brief stint as, at an, inter, as an intern at Miramax, she directed The Farm with Jonathan Stack. It was released in 1998, earned an Oscar nomination, also two Emmys, and the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance. What a start. People often talk about impact when they talk about documentary films, but how's this for impact? Ashanti Witherspoon, a death row inmate, was released on parole after 25 years in prison due to the farm, partly due to the farm. 
Also, Wilbert Rideau, a death row inmate whom Liz befriended while making the farm, and actually has a credit on the film, I noticed, has subsequently had his sentence commuted from murder to manslaughter and was released in 2005 after serving 44 years in prison. Liz's films reveal a deep commitment to social justice. As she has said of her body of work, she has a desire to tell stories of humanity in all of its gray areas. And it is in those gray areas where her filmmaking power and artistry are most apparent. In 1998, Liz partnered with filmmaker Rory Kennedy to co-found Moxie Fire, uh, Firecracker Films. Their films have been some of the most critically acclaimed, hotly debated, and talked about documentaries in the field. They've covered human rights issues, injustice, extraordinary figures who have influenced society, and they've made films for most of the major broadcasters and cable networks across the globe. Liz's most recent film, Nothing Left Unsaid, Gloria Vanderbilt and Anderson Cooper, which aired on HBO, had its world premiere at 20, at, uh, tw in 2016 at Sundance. Her previous film, the widely acclaimed What Happened Miss Simone, was nominated for a 2016 Oscar for Best Documentary Feature, received a Peabody Award, six Emmy nominations, including Best Directing, and took home the Emmy for Best Documentary. Miss Simone opened Sundance Film Festival and had its European premiere at the Berlin Alley. The film delves into the life of Nina Simone drawing from more than 100 hours of never-before-heard audio tapes, rare concert footage, and archival interviews. Some of Liz's other past works include Love, Marilyn, which was hailed as a miracle of documentary. Uh, the fi that film boasted a cast of A-list characters reading from Monroe's never-before-seen private writings. In 2011, her film Bobby Fischer Against the World which also opened at Sundance, was called Brilliant by Entertainment Weekly. It chronicled the great Cold War showdown between Fisher and Boris Spassky in 1972. Shortly thereafter, Garbus produced the Oscar-nominated documentary short Killing in, in the Name, which was directed by her partner Rory Kennedy. Other directing credits include Girlhood, which was called one of the most important films of the year in 2003 by LA Weekly, The Execution of Wanda Jean, Nazi Officer's Wife, Coma, Shouting Fire, Stories from the Edge of Free Speech, which we'll see tonight, and There's Something Wrong with Aunt Diane. Some of her producing credits include Street Fight, which was Oscar nominated in 2005, and Ghosts of Abu Ghraib, which won an Emmy for Best Doc. Liz is currently shooting a documentary series about the New York Times aggressive coverage of the Trump administration, which will examine how the newspaper is covering Trump within the context of the larger role of the fourth estate. Liz's career has featured a dazzling array of remarkable films that grapple with issues of social justice in contemporary society. They offer artful and revealing portraits of some of the most culturally significant figures of our times. In recognition of these outstanding achievements, it's my pleasure to present to Liz Garbus the 2017 Lumiere Career Achievement Award. Thank you. I just, I need to take a nap after that. That's like, <laughs> um, Susan, thank you so much for that incredible um, introduction. Um, I still feel like um, I'm, you know, that 28, 29 year old pitching films and if anybody was ever interested in them or decide to invest in them, just feeling like I had just pulled the wool over their eyes and how the hell is this actually happening that anyone's giving me money to make a film. Um, and then, um, you know, somehow I'm not that 28, 29 year old anymore and I don't know where, how that happened, but it did. And um, I appreciate you a lot. And we did, I mean, the farm, Susan was um, an incredible supporter early on, um, right there at the beginning. Um, this means so much. Jackie, thank you so much. Karen, thank you guys so much for inviting me. I'm truly humbled and honored to be here. Um, uh, it's really, um, 
I'm, I'm so happy you guys invited this film and chose this film uh, that I made and that came out in two, 2009 called Shouting Fire. Um, the film, uh, you know, it's, it's not about my father, but it's about the work that inspired my father and um, some of the work my father did and the work that um, on free speech and, and its limits or lack thereof um, that you know we talked about every night at the dinner table as a kid growing up and I think um, that those conversations and the resistance of easy answers and fighting for the rights of even those whose ideas you might find abhorrent um, that type of um, nuance and resistance to um, to uh, I don't, you know, never, never putting anything in a box, never, never making anything simple, is where my drive to tell stories of, about complex characters who were often misunderstood. And when I made the film about Nina Simone, um, and even the film about Bobby Fischer, people said, "Oh, this is interesting. This is sort of a departure from your work. You made The Farm or Girlhood, and you're making these verite films." But in, I think that I'm, I'm, I'm always drawn to. Um, those characters existing in those gray areas and resisting easy interpretation who are often misunderstood and mislabeled and and diving into that that gray and I think that that came from those dinner conversations and a father who represented the Nazis right to march in Skokie and 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 kind of internalizing the complexities of what it meant to live in a democracy and live in this country with a lot of ugliness um, that's creeping in in every corner and especially now um, and, and then that, you know, I'm continuing that now. I'm making a film in the New York Times about the New York Times, not for the New York Times, but about the New York Times and about the journalists who are working to cover this uh, very difficult administration which has, you know, declared the press the enemy and um, truth um, has undermined the concept of truth and um, is, you know, we're being gaslit on a daily basis. Um, so it's sort of all coming uh, full circle. Um, in any case, my children, who I'm always leaving, and I'm saying I'm I'm really sorry. I have to go on this shoot, and I'm going to be back in X number of days. And and you know they they've gotten very used to that. So it's it's really nice when they get to be part of this and see why it is that I'm leaving. Um, and so Amelia and Theo, I appreciate you putting up with that and your glee and support in seeing the the, the final product. Um, you, you giving your time to me for that means so much to me. And to my husband, who is um, my great um, partner in life and also creative um, inspiration, he gives the best notes. Anybody who knows Dan Kogan has ever shown him a film knows he gives the best note. We call him Mr. Note in the edit room. Um, we need Mr. Note. Um, so um, I appreciate you and all your love and support. And of course, my father and his friend Anne, I appreciate you guys being here so much. Um, this award is, a, I'm humbled by those who have gotten this before me to be in their company. I, I, I kind of, um, I find it shocking and I'm, I'm just so honored and to be amongst all of you here from the documentary community, uh, what a turnout. It's so nice to see all these faces. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop talking. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. So uh, when did when did you guys last see this film? That it's I think I haven't I probably haven't watched it since two thousand and nine or two you know it's been a while and it's really I mean a lot's happened since then. <laughs> yeah, it I really mean, holds God, up. we saw Bill O'Reilly and Matt Lauer. <laughs> no, but uh, no, I mean right. It's a you know it's a, a campaign um, by the right, which has obviously been very successful. Any any thoughts, Martin, uh, about the? Oh, any any thoughts about how the landscape has changed? It's, it's, it's remarkable. It's such a brilliant film. It's a story about today. And she did it ten years ago. Her perception of what their country was going was wonderful. Well, and the courts, and I mean, uh, you know, the the your your warning about the courts is 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 just. I mean, it's just gotten. Right, you've seen clearly now what Trump can do 
and the disaster that it'll be, whatever disaster I thought it was going to be then with Roberts, it's clear that that's gotten more disastrous. And more judges have been appointed in this first year than I think in any, I mean, right. certainly an than Obama's. He has an opportunity to totally stack the federal trial courts, appellate courts, and given the fact that the Republicans cover, co control so many states, an ability to pack the state court judges. And you've seen what Trump can do. And actually, War Churchill, the, uh, he ultimately lost. I mean, it went all the way up to the Supreme Court of Colorado, which upheld the original decision that he could be fired. Right. And then the Supreme Court refused to hear it. Right. So he's, I mean, he's, right. he has not and had my And my too. memory is not very good, but my memory is Debbie lost also. I was right. She, ne she never, she, she was moved to a desk job, yeah. So what are the cases now that you're watching? Well, the Supreme Court now has nine cases before it in the First Amendment area. It's the first time that the Supreme Court has that many cases. Uh, you're talking about church-state cases, demonstration cases, um, interpretations of class rights of journalists, so that, I mean, the cases are presented in a different way. The most recent case was the ice cream cake uh, case. Um, and and uh, in that case, a baker refused uh, the request of two men who wanted to get married to have two men put at the top of the uh, cake. And the question was, and he relied on the First Amendment. He says, I have a First Amendment right uh, not to be forced to do something that I don't want to do. And I have a First Amendment right uh, the baker, not, this the is baker, the baker's the baker, right, right. that I have a First Amendment right not to uh, adopt a position that I don't believe in. Now, the, if, if everybody had a First Amendment right to make those kinds of distinctions, that would be the end of discrimination laws, for example. Then uh, a hotel owner could say, I'm not going to, my First Amendment right tells me I have the right to say that I'm not in favor of integration that I have the right to keep these people out of the prison, uh, out of the hotel. So that if you take all of these cases that are there before the court, church against state, and then of course you had a church state issue in the tax bill, then you really see uh, an extraordinarily severe cut down, which we all know about. Liz, you talked a little bit about how your father's work as a warrior for First Amendment protections affected you, but can you elaborate on that a little bit? Watch the movie. No. <laughs> um, I don't I mean, you know, it's, it's all, it's all, you know, it's all nebulous. It's all like in the, you know, the, the, the broth in the soup, the stock in the soup. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, I think that, um, I mean, you know, he never, my father never gave any, the easy answers. Um, you know, when things hurt or they're hard, I mean, he didn't ever try to say that, okay, it's gonna be better and it's, we're gonna make this better, we're going to fix it. It was, oh, you know, you, you, had to, you, you had to exist with your discomfort of not knowing or not thinking something was fair. Um, and I think that was, you know, a good place to grow up with understanding that that's the way life was. And I think that, for me, has informed my choices and my understanding of, you know, what projects I've gravitated towards and which stories. I think all of Lizzie's films have shown the balance. Nina Simone, who she was, her great talent, which she believed in, which she was bedeviled by. The wonderful film that Lizzie made, uh, The Farm, which, uh, anticipate, which shows about the wrongful incarceration en masse of black people. So the subjects that Lizzie has chosen in her films, not just this film, but go across the whole area of what's wrong with the society, what can be fixed, and what can't be fixed. So this is just typical, it was mentioned before she uh, <clears throat> directed 26 films, produced 37. Uh, they all have that strain in them. And the remarkable things about her films 
if you were to see the film The Farm Today, which was made, I think, in 1998, 20 years ago, it seems as if it was made yesterday. If you were to see her film Girlhood, which talks about, well, it's, it's complicated. She can sum it up. It's a film, it's a film that could have been made yesterday. So, or when she talks about the pressures that are brought on Bobby Fischer, the Cold War, it could have been made yesterday. And I, I'm amazed that this film also is about today and yesterday. So prescient. Yes. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, look, these battles have been, I mean, as the film shows, have, they've been going on for quite some time. Um, you know, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson had a little conversation about it. So um, <laughs> it's the, I mean, but the, we are certainly, I mean, with the Muslim ban, I mean, we're certainly living these moments very fully right now. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, a lot of these, you know, uh, there'll be a great abridgment of rights continuing and, um, we'll see. How, was it difficult, when I think about the, the theme of the film and the, it, the issues that you're grappling with, was it difficult to get this film made? It, it wasn't because, I mean, quite honestly, the film was suggested to me by Sheila Nevins. I, I did not have the, I mean, we were talking about protest in, um, after 9-11 and we were talking about different ways of attacking that subject. And we had actually been talking about a case that my father was working on and the film started off as a look into that case. It was a high school, uh, the Connecticut, there were some kids yes, trying to yes, put yes, on yes. a play in a Connecticut high school and the school was trying to ban the play. And we started by shooting that story of these kids um, and something happened where I don't know why. I mean, honestly, I was the, the, I couldn't get access to anybody in the school. I mean, there was just something yeah, that, that there was something, bad. there was some impediment. And then we just sort of trying to think about, you know, how, different ways to tell the story and to look at it. Um, and then it, it built into this, you know, sort of looking at different instant, you know, different threats to free speech through the prism of my father's own experience as one of its defenders. Um, it really makes the subject so accessible. Just, you know, thinking about the connection between the two of you and, um, you know. She had a determination when she was four. It had very little to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, and for me as a film, as a, it's a different style of film. I mean, it's a much more, it's an essay, it's an essay film, which is not actually typically what I had made, but I think the reason it worked for me was that there was that personal, you know, of course it was a personal story in some sense, so. Martin, what keeps you up at night when you think about where we are today with respect to First Amendment? <laughs> I think everybody here can answer that question. I think everybody here can answer that question. Well, no, but specifically around the First Amendment. <laughs> well, the whole question of protest, the whole question, and Obama wasn't so great at this, in stopping journalists and prosecuting journalists. Right in the extent to which uh, surveillance has been expanded. There have been cases before the Supreme Court now about putting, GP, uh, putting a, a GPS system, let's say, in somebody's car so you can track them. I mean, privacy probably is gonna be so seriously damaged that you can say that, I mean, that right is gonna be so battered that it's gonna be hard to say that it's right of privacy any longer and certainly under this administration, and certainly under this court. And then if you look at the ages of Ruth Ginsburg, of Judge Breyer, uh, it, you, it's, it's awful. And then if you look at the ages of the judges in the Circuit Court of Appeals, and the vacancies in that court, now the, as the Supreme Court takes fewer and fewer cases, which they've been doing over the years, and certainly Roberts has turned off the spigot. Then the opinions of the Circuit Court of Appeals really become the, opinion, the deciding factors in the United States. So we don't pay that much attention to the judges being appointed to those courts. And also, as I said, the fact that the number of governorships and legislatures in the states that are dominated by Republicans mean that you're in for an extraordinary time. 
Why don't we open it up to questions? Um, anybody? Uh, yes, in the way back. Yeah, there is a uh, Israel anti-boycott law going on right now that there are almost 20 Democratic senators that are willing to sign this bill. I mean, it just feels that it becomes a watered down, you know, republic where you are so used to your rights being taken away just with the privacy. I can see how we become mm -hmm. complacent, but we have Democratic senators in large numbers who are willing to take away that free speech at this moment. Well, in the future, how many Democratic senators are going to drift to the right as you have Trump's supposed populist movement? How many sen Democratic senators are going to try to get what they perceive to be the uneducated, the, the college vote, or the uneducated vote, the non-college vote? So I think you're going to see enormous uh, leaving uh, and thinning out of the Democratic Party. It's hard to think of many Democratic senators that are totally committed to the kind of values that the people in this room have. You can count on them perhaps one hand. Yes, right there. Is fake news protected by the First Amendment? I don't know what you mean by fake news. I think it's very interesting in the uh, Ken Burns film uh, about the Vietnam War, you hear Lyndon Johnson talking about the fake news that was attacking him over Vietnam. So Mr. Trump didn't invent it. Uh, our presidents have used it often over time. Uh, but, but if, a, if a blog says, oh, you know, or like what happened during the campaign, oh, Hillary Clinton is dying of a brain tumor, you know, like this, this kind of disinformation that's put out, what is, the, what is their be, First Amendment protection? They but, have to be protected. I mean, there are libel laws, there are factual laws about journalists putting out stuff. Well, that's the question, But, but right? they have the right to put out fake news. They have the right, uh, Fox News has the right to say what they're saying. I think it's interesting to contemplate if the Pentagon Papers had been released at the time that it was made, whether that would not have saved tens of thousands of American lives, hundreds of thousands of the lives of Vietnamese. So if the truth got out early about that war, then you might, I don't know when you went in, but you might not have to have gone there. So it seems to me that the Pentagon... I was not forced to go there. Okay, okay. Uh, but I think that uh, that argument would be, I think, that the First Amendment would have protected you far more than a suppressed First Amendment would have done. I believe that. I mean, I know the Pentagon Papers fairly well. By the way, Dan Ellsberg is coming out with a book next week that I, that I think is worth reading called Doomsday. And, <laughs> and in cheery news. <laughs> well, one question um, that comes to mind is, does the um, you know, availability of, of guns and open carry uh, affect your thinking about um, the, you know, safety of people to, you know, um, gather in in protest and. Um, sure, I think the question about whether or not you can stop people from carrying guns during a protest. In other words, the question with respect to a protest is, let's say, this case in the United States Supreme Court called Brandenburg, namely. Uh, can there be a dangerous situation because of this particular uh, demonstration? In Skokie, the question was whether the Nazis going up and down the street, given the place they were doing it, could there be something dangerous? In Charlottesville, the question was, could there be something dangerous? And as we now know, which was apparent if you watched the demonstration, is that the police did not prepare for it, were not there. And I think a report just came out a few days ago, maybe yesterday or the day before, saying how badly the police uh, acted and not in action, in action. And if you watch the uh, media that were carrying the story, CNN, et cetera, and the police were up there and the other people, uh, how very careful everybody was. To s nobody was there complimenting the police. 
So uh, I think that uh, if you can't stop guns from being carried, in other words, it, you could legitimately stop a protest if a lot of people there have guns and you have reason to believe that these guns are going to go off. Uh, it then becomes the obligation of the state, city, National Guard, whoever, to do all they can to make the demonstration safe, whether it be Skokie, Charlottesville, it doesn't matter. That's the burden of government to make it safe. That's where they have to stretch out and they have to do something so that the next time there's something like the Pentagon Papers, we'll know about it earlier. Other questions? Uh, yeah, I, I do. If uh, a car company, uh, Cadillac, could be sued for not providing information or design uh, information that they have, uh, which makes cars more safe, safer to drive, and, and, and over a period of time, they found information that shows that this is the case. Why can't gun manufacturers be sued for the same problem? First of all, the question comes from D.A. Pennybaker, one of the great filmmakers of our time. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there is a lawsuit now uh, against a gun maker, I think it's a Connecticut lawsuit, claiming that the gun makers are responsible, in other words, like launching a grenade into the public that no one can control. The gun makers at this point should know that putting out this kind of instrument inevitably leads to death, also tries to make gun makers, states, other localities which have background check laws, which clear fail so much of the time, tries to make other entities responsible. My judgment is the case loses, and if it doesn't lose now, it will certainly lose as it goes up on appeal. But not among the judiciary. Lizzie says I'm not an optimist. <laughs> Back in the back. I want to go back to what you said about the um, right of journalists to publish things that are not true. How does that help democracy? Well, <laughs> you know, actually, it's, you know, my father actually took a case that changed his career, which, you know, for, we didn't put it in this film because it, but he, there was a, a young woman who um, was raped in Prospect Park. And um, the New York, and then, so she, she, she this, this happened, she was picked up by police, if I get it wrong, you'll correct me, but she was picked up by police. They said, you know, can we drive around, find, you know, find the person who did it. And she gave a description of a of a of a black man who did it, and they were just kept on pulling over guys, and they were like, and she she kind of she she laughed out of the officer. She's like, I didn't say it was a short black. I said it was a tall guy, and you're just pulling over any black man. And she got into this antagonistic relationship with the the police a little bit. Went and spoke at a protest and set, and sort of criticized the police and their racial profiling. And then the the New York Daily News wrote a series of pieces saying that her rape that her rape was a hoax for her political purposes. And they wrote that uh, one piece, right? And then she, they, she, they were presented with the proof of the rape and the, the, the medical examination. And then they went on to then write two more pieces, again saying that, that it was a hoax. And you, despite your First Amendment tradition, decided to represent her in a case right. against the New York Daily News, which made many, many people very angry at you and got you kicked out of a wherever the right. First Amendment Lawyers right. Club was. Right. And effectively... And literally, <laughs> literally. And um, why did you take that case, and what was the, the um, nuance of the law that made you feel like you might be able to win? I thought the cops, uh, uh, that the Daily News had lied, that there was a journalist called McAlary, who had been a well-known journalist in New York, and then he had an accident, and he was trying to recapture the place that he once had. And uh, I thought that he had written a lot of irresponsible stories before which savaged people. And this one, 
sal uh, savaged this woman who said that she'd been raped, she was raped, and he went into the fact that she was a lesbian, and he went into the fact that she had demonstrated while she was at college uh, an anti-apartheid uh, demonstration. Uh, I felt that uh, he was malicious, hostile, uh, and Why I Why is that different than the fake news that we see now, if somebody... Well, because I think there's a value to, there's some value to saying that uh, Trump, whatever he says, uh, I think, I see that as part of the argument. This I saw as a deliberate attack on a woman. By the way, I'm not consistent about anything. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not that. But I had the woman in my office, and I felt that this was a guy who was totally intent on destroying her. Uh, ultimately, what happened was we went before a judge who had hoped to go to the Court of Appeals, uh, be appointed as the first Hispanic judge. And when we went to court, the Daily News was represented by Rudy Giuliani, who then had power in New York. And the Judge Ramos knew that he had power in New York. And the Judge Ramos tossed us out of court. Mm. So well, I what think- was, There was a legal standard where if you print a lie, you know, it was the number of times that they were repeating a lie even after being presented with information. But why does that not like a pizza gate or something like that when somebody's- Well, I, th I think you always have to make certain kinds of decisions. I think, I'm not saying that there should never be libel laws uh, that you can sue somebody. I mean, Debbie and I talked about what rights she had because of that article. And that article, I told her she couldn't sue for libel. That that article dealt with larger issues than just her life alone. Uh, I, I don't think there's anybody who would say there should not be any kind of libel law at all. Libel law is an infringement on the First Amendment. You are punishing people uh, uh, for what they say. So in the uh, McAlary New York case with Jane Doe, we kept her name out of the newspapers, uh, he had uh, um, evidence. They, at the beginning, when he wrote the first stories, he didn't have ev uh, they didn't have evidence of semen. They didn't have a lot of other evidence. Ultimately, they had all that. And even though they had all that, and he knew about it, he kept doing it. He really wanted to get back his career. Nora Ephron then did a play called Lucky Guy uh, in Broadway, which was uh, a pro maculary play, which talked about how sympathetic one should be to him. Uh, I wrote a series of articles for the New York Times, one article for the New York Times about it, uh, attacking Nora for uh, justifying uh, what McAleary did to this woman. Mm -hmm. I'm still a little confused. <laughs> <laughs> Why is a free press or free speech includes the right to lie in, in the print? Well, I think if you're lying about, let's say, what, what, let's say what Lyndon Johnson, get away from Trump, what Lyndon Johnson said, we were winning the war, that it would be over soon, that the body counts were extraordinary, uh, that to me is fake news. And that's also part of the public debate. You then have to answer that. At the time, and, and Lyndon Johnson, certainly totally different than Trump, but during Vietnam, the people who ran the government tried very hard to suppress facts that would have contradicted what they were doing. The Pentagon Papers was an attempt to rewrite history or to stop history from showing you exactly what would have happened. Uh, if I could have sued on behalf of Debbie, I would have. I, you could not under the libel law. What do you call her a libel? Would it, pardon me? It depends. It, it depends. A liar can be, can be called libelous. It depends the facts that are in the article. Debbie was not in a position to endanger her job, to do that. So there are all kinds of considerations. Well, I think if people can say things, people have come to me who have wanted to sue for libel 
for a variety of reasons or invasions of privacy because what has been said by anonymous bloggers. Under the present law, you can't sue someone who's anonymous. Should you be able to sue the people who allow those bloggers to be there, uh, for, and the answer is yes. And I think we're making a, a ten, you know, just stepping aside, people are trying to hold Facebook and other people now responsible for the kinds of things that are put on the media. The balance is, uh, if you put too much responsibility on Facebook to stop things, where will they go when they stop it? You can't give them the power alone to decide whether fake news should, or whether something supported by the Russian government shouldn't go on. It's, I think if you ask the question, would you rather have Facebook operate without surveillance or with surveillance, I think it becomes very difficult. I think you can make arguments about individual people being destroyed and libeled, as I saw the McLeary Jane Doe case, and governmental fake news. You might be able to hold, but it, it's very difficult. Uh, and, and the problem has not been resolved, and it's not near been resolved about how you deal with the destruction that anonymous bloggers can do to people. It seems, and, and also, given Trump's commitment, it seems, to people who own the internet, it's hard to see that they will expand laws against those people in order to make them liable. So the probabilities of all this net neutrality, I think, is that there'll be less free speech than ever before. And it won't be the anonymous bloggers who hurt somebody, it'll be political stuff. Last question. Um, a lot of the questions that have come up uh, in some ways bear on the age of the Constitution and where we are now with electronic media and with enormous disparity of wealth and with gerrymandering and the courts and even things like the Electoral College. To what extent do you think profoundly the whole question of constitutional foundational assumptions are, where do you think we are with that at this point? I'm prepared to speak for seven hours. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, talking to the major issues you're talking about, how do you decide, how do you interpret the Constitution? Clarence Thomas Scalia looked back at the Constitution as it was written then. And they look at that time and they try and use that to define uh, today's situation. The, pardon? Well, Gorsuch is there, of course, yes. There is a man named William Pryor who was appointed to the Circuit Court of Appeals by Justice Trump, uh, pardon me, <laughs> <laughs> by President Trump. Uh, William Pryor had argued a case on behalf of the state of Alabama. A, uh, a, a black defendant uh, in jail was taken out in the hot Alabama sun and was hitched to what they call a hitching post with his arms above him. And they had a pail of water here, which a dog had come over and used, but he couldn't use it. And they kept the guy out in the yard for days on end. Pryor argued for the state of Alabama, which wanted to uphold the fact that you could do that to somebody. And he said, if you just look at what was going on in 1789, 1811, this kind of conduct was permitted. And therefore, if you're an originalist, it should be upheld. That was Pryor's argument. Uh, the Circuit Court of Appeals upheld it. The United States Supreme Court reversed it. This was years ago before Gorsuch. So the whole question of originalism and when you look, I mean, all the issues that you raised, whether it be First Amendment school issues or prison issues, or surveillance, all the way that Scalia happened, interestingly enough, in a, in a surveillance case to stop surveillance, a particular type of surveillance, and he didn't go back to what was going on in 1789. But the probabilities are 
that more and more the standard will be what did the Constitution mean when it was written and what, what were the practices when it was written. It's impossible to conceive or just imagine judges writing decisions and looking at 1789 and 1911 and 1811 and saying that should be the standard for how people are treated now in the United States. It's impossible if you read Clarence Thomas's decisions, opinions. Uh, I'd really like to thank Liz and Martin for an amazing conversation. Uh, it's really been an honor to have you both here.